very, very good to be with you again. So, tonight, we are chilling in bed again together. And we're just going to do what we usually do. Just hang out, talk. And tonight, I have a few books with me. Um, a couple of them I have read. One of them I have not, that I can recall anyway. Um, and then the first book that I have is one that I got for Christmas, I think when I was 12 or 13. And it's called Knots for the Outdoors. Um, so when I was younger, I really enjoyed being outside. I still do, but I spent a lot more time um, out in the woods when I was younger. Uh, I've always been kind of like a loner. Um, I didn't really like hang out with a lot of people in school and stuff like that. Like after school, um, I would come home, do my homework, and kind of do my own thing. And I spent a lot of time um, outside in the woods. Uh, if you don't know, I live in Maine, so there's woods everywhere. <laughs> um, but there's some like directly behind where I live as well, and quite a bit of it as well. So I would get my homework done, and I would go just get lost in the woods. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed it. I spent a lot of time just like climbing trees. I actually used to take books out into the woods too, now that I think about it. Um, I don't know, and I would just sit outside and think a lot. But uh, anyway, my dad knew that I enjoyed the outdoors. So one year he got me this book, Knots for the Outdoors. And I did learn three or four of these knots, I think. Some of them are kind of complicated though. Just let you take a look. So yeah, I learned a few. I definitely don't remember them anymore. Like, hey, actually, I think this is one of the ones that I learned. What's it called? Yes, definitely. Fisherman's Knot. It's definitely one of the ones that I learned. It's really fascinating, though. And crazy, too. Oh, and this is another one that I learned right here. Like right before the fisherman's knot. This one's called Cat's Paw. So I'm just going to tap on these for you. And pray to God my neighbors will stay quiet. Books have like this really like hollow, bassy kind of sound that I really enjoy. You can't see me. That's okay. So for this video and my last video, the hair brushing one, I've been using my um, binaural headphones and I really enjoy them. They definitely have a, a nice sound quality to them and um, you really can't get much better for binaural. 
microphones than these. some kind of exciting news. Next month, um, the 9th, I am going on vacation for a little over a week. I'm very excited. I'm going to visit my family in New York. I went last June as well. I used to go every summer um, when I was a kid, but once I started working, it became more and more difficult to get time off. And um, I actually went like seven or eight years, I think without visiting. Actually makes me really sad to think about now <laughs> going that long without seeing my family. But I was able to make it last year and it was awesome. It was so good to see my family. Um, most of my family lives in New York. My mom, my sister, uh, my aunt and my uncle, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. Um, my dad's brothers live in New York, some of my uncles um, on his side. Um, quite a bit of family. And I'm very, very close with all of them. Especially my aunt and my uncle. I, uh, I absolutely adore them. They are fantastic people. And I uh, mentioned this in one of my other videos before, but when uh, I was younger, Um, my dad ran into some uh, medical issues uh, and he wasn't able to take care of us for about a year and uh, we had nowhere else to go because my um, my mother is bipolar and at the time she was sick so I couldn't go stay with her, and uh, I really didn't have any other family to go stay with. But very thankfully, my aunt and uncle, um, they didn't have any kids at the time, and they had a house big enough for me and my brother to come and stay with them. So we ended up staying with my aunt and uncle for a year or so, maybe a little shorter or longer. Um, but <laughs> it was it was a experience for both parties, my brother and I, and my aunt and uncle. We kind of gave them a crash course in parenting. I was in junior high school and my brother would have still been in elementary school. But, uh, so it, you know, I was pretty much like prime teenage years. So I was a handful, I'm sure. But extremely grateful uh, for them in doing that. 
anyways the next book I have is by probably my favorite author uh, Dean Koontz and this book is called Odd Hours uh, and then this is actually a series of books about um, the main character his name's Odd Thomas and if you haven't checked out Dean Koontz or read any of his books I highly highly recommend that you do because he's a fantastic author um, and if you like animals specifically dogs um, almost all of his books have a dog in them uh, they're good Dean Koontz is fantastic So my hair is starting to grow back in <laughs> and I have pretty like thick hair and when it's like this length it's kind of a pain it gets all like frizzy and doesn't listen to me I was looking at um, pictures of myself with longer hair and it was definitely making me miss it. How it looks anyway. I hate taking care of it. Here, I'll actually, um, oh, look, I have an old GNC, a couple old GNC receipts in here. <laughs> what the heck? Must have been using them as a bookmark. But yeah, I'll read here, chapter 24. A universal solvent poured through the world, dissolving the works of man and nature. Shapes like buildings loomed in vague detail. Geometric fence rows separated nothing from nothing, and their rigid geometry melted into mist at both ends. Portions of trees floated into and out of sight, like driftwood on a white flood. Gray grass spilled down slopes that slid away as though they were hills of ashes, too insubstantial to maintain their contours. The dog and I ran for a while, changed direction several times, and then we walked out of nil and into naught, through vapor into vapor. See, like I said, dog. <laughs> At some point I became aware that the weather was something more than mere weather. The stillness and the fog and the chill were not solely the consequences of meteorological systems. I began to suspect and soon felt certain that the condition of magic beach on this night was a presentment, a symbolic statement of things to come. The dog and I journeyed through a dreamscape where thick smoke smoldered from fires long extinguished and the fumes had no odor in a world purged of every stink and fragrance. The air pooled in stillness because the winds had died and would never breathe again, and the silence betold a world of solid stone where the planetary core had gone cold, where no rivers ran and seas no longer stirred with tides, where no clocks existed because no time remained to be counted. When the dog and I stopped and stood entirely still, 
the white nada settled under us, no longer disturbed by our passage, and the pavement began to disappear beneath my feet, beneath his paws. Such a terror rose in me that I exhaled explosively, with relief when the sudden swish of his tail disturbed the bleached void and revealed, after all, the texture of the blacktop. Yet a moment later, I felt that I had entered the valley of death, and at once had passed into some place beyond even that, into an emptiness of such perfection, that it contained no atom of the world that had been, not even a memory of nature, or of the things of man, a place that lacked the substance to be a place, that was more accurately a condition. Here no hope existed for the past or for a future. No hope of the world that had been or of the world that might have been. I was not having a premonition. Instead, I was walking through a night that had become a premonition. Black is the combination of all colors, and white is the utter absence of color. The fog foretold a nullity of non-being, a vacuum within a vacuum, the end of history following the ultimate annihilation. So much death was coming that it would be the end of death, such absolute destruction that nothing would escape to be destroyed hence. The terror that the dog's tail briefly brushed away returned to me and would not be dispelled again. For a while I was aware of proceeding from nothing into nothing, my mind a deep well from the bottom of which I tried to scream. But like the lingering dead who came to me for assistance, I was not able to make a sound. I could only pray silently, and I prayed to be led to a haven, a place with shape and color and scent and sound, a refuge from this awful nothingness where I could press back the terror and be able to think. Like a dreamer aware of dreaming, I knew the geometric shape half resolved out of the amorphous clouds, and I was conscious of the exertion of climbing steps, though I never saw them. I must have found the heavy door and pulled it wide, but even after I had crossed the threshold into shadow and light, with the golden retriever still at my side. And even after I had closed out of the foreboding mist, I did not immediately realize the nature of the refuge into which I had been led, led by providence or by canine. So that just gives you a little taste of his writing. Um, a lot of Dean Koontz's books are... I don't want to say scary, but they're like suspenseful thrillers. Um, I really like his writing style. Dean Koontz, check him out. Uh, so 
So I think we'll stick with Mr. Koontz. Um, this is the book that I have not read, read yet, as far as I can remember. Um, it's called Relentless. That's a picture of Dean Koontz on the back. And he has, I believe, two golden retrievers. Um, so he's definitely a dog lover, which is why dogs always find their way into his books. Um, I have so many books by him, though. I can't remember which ones I've read. I probably have 30 or 40 Dean Koontz books. Um... And I've read almost all of them, so they kind of, it's kind of hard to remember. And I read them all quite a while ago now. It's been quite some time since I read a book, unfortunately. There's a signature. Like embossed in the book there. See how this one sounds. So I just wanted to uh, apologize for taking some extra time off from YouTube. Um, sometimes I just need some time to myself. I honestly am not that comfortable with <laughs> um, putting myself on display. Um, difficult as that may seem or as hard to believe as that may seem, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, it's weird, I'll go through like, um, stages almost where like, a couple months, it doesn't bother me at all. And then a month here and there, like I'll get super self-conscious and not want to, you know, like show myself or record myself um it's the same thing on like social media like instagram i'll go through like just these spells where i don't want to post anything um at least not showcasing myself so i apologize for that <laughs> That sounds good.
suggested that I will read a chapter, well, not a chapter, a little bit of this book to you as well. Chapter 10. The temptation was great to believe that I had passed from the dream of the library into a dream of blindness and had not yet come awake. As a writer, I succeed by deceiving readers into accepting that the story I'm telling is as true as their lives, that what happens to my characters should intellectually and emotionally involve them no less than they should be concerned about their real-world neighbors. But I have never been good at self-deception. I was awake, all right, and wax stood or crouched or roamed somewhere in the bedroom. My first impulse was to scream like a little girl. Fortunately, I repressed the urge. Wax was one of those critics with crocodile genes. He would find most delicious any prey that was saturated with the pheromones of fear. My nightstand, like the one on the farther, farther side of the bed, was an antique Chinese chest with numerous small drawers of different sizes. In the top drawer closest to me, I kept a flashlight, which allowed me to find my way to the bathroom at night without switching on a lamp and waking Penny. Each evening before going to bed, I pulled this drawer partway out of the nightstand so I could get the flashlight without making a disturbance. I am an incompetent handyman, but a considerate husband. Now I groped around in the darkness, found the open drawer, and reached into it. The flashlight wasn't there. I knew I had not misplaced it earlier. Wax must have removed it before he woke me. And he also kept a flashlight in a drawer on her nightstand. Most likely Wax had confiscated that one as well. Evidently, he had a flashlight of his own, with which he had stealthily prowled the room as we slept. If I wanted one, I would have to take him away, his away from him. Although I fully understood the wisdom of owning a gun, I didn't keep one in the house. But he had been raised in a virtual armory, and had no objection to firearms. But I had a covenant with death to spare others as once I had been spared. I assumed Sherman Wax possessed a gun as well as a butcher knife, a switchblade, an axe, a chainsaw, a power drill with an assortment of bits, and a wood chipper. Within reach, I had a couple of pillows and a bedside lamp. As far as I could tell, Penny still slept. I saw no value in waking her at once. Until Wax switched on his light and revealed his position, he and I were equally blind. Because I knew the bedroom so much better than he did, the darkness counted slightly to my advantage. He had heard me sit up in bed and gasp for breath when I broke out of my dream but the noises I'd made might as likely have been those of a man thrashing at the sheets and turning over in his troubled sleep. The first doom seemed to me to have been spoken in the lightless aisles of the dream library, and Wax could not be sure that I heard him say it the second time. Letting out a soft groan, then murmuring wordlessly, I pretended to be negotiating a nightmare, using this anxious muttering as a cover I eased off the bed and, falling silent, crouched beside it. So, a little taste of Relentless. The last book I think I will share with you is a little beat up actually, <laughs> which actually kind of makes sense. <laughs> it's called Got Fight. Um, I used to be really into mixed martial arts, um, the UFC. Not so much anymore. I actually don't follow it at all. <laughs> but um, 
one of my favorite fighters was Forrest Griffin, who is the author of this book, if you didn't see that. Um, and it's just a bunch of nonsense, this book. It's kind of like a comical self-help book. Like here, before you even get to the first chapter, I'll read this to you. Just a little blurb here. You should be in good physical condition before beginning this or any martial arts program. The author and the publisher assume no responsibility for any injury suffered or damages or losses incurred during or as a result of following the program in this book. Note from the publisher. We and Forrest had some harsh verbal and physical altercations in the course of selecting a title for this book, which is obviously God Fight. If you missed it, we wouldn't go admitting that to anyone because it's on the damn cover. Forrest is a formidable opponent, one with devastating leg kicks, six submissions, and a jaw like a cast iron stove. But we bite and he tapped out, and we got our wish to call this book God Fight, which we think is pretty freaking provocative. But we did agree to note his objection in the beginning of the book. <laughs> Here's a phone message Forrest left for his editor on New Year's Eve 2009. We suspect that alcohol was involved. I hate to beat a dead horse, but you sound like a woman on your fucking little answering machine there. <laughs> this is Forrest Griffin. As you can tell, I'm from fucking Georgia. Not just Georgia. Fucking Georgia. Got Fight is not a good title for me. Look, the whole Got Milk thing was 1994. I actually googled that shit. 1990 fucking four. It's more than a decade past, brother, so uh, we're going to come up with a new title and you're going to develop a manly voice like mine. <laughs> Dark raspy laugh. It's just a ridiculous book filled with nonsense. Let me see if I can find a picture of him in case you don't know who he is. Uh... <laughs> Here he is. There's some better pictures. The other ones he was all jacked up and beat up. There he is. The rifle. Um, one of his weigh-ins. He likes guns. But he's one of my, or was one of my favorite UFC fighters. So when I found out that he was ma or writing a book, I had to have it. This was actually another um, Christmas present. Now that I think about it, I might have got both of them the same year highly possible.
actually um, lifted before this. I took a shower and then realized my right eye is like bloodshot in the corner here. Looks fantastic. you don't follow me on social media, Instagram, Patreon, the um, past month or so, I've been like hardcore dieting, um, you know, getting ready for summer. So that's one of the other reasons I haven't posted in a while, is I've just been like dead. <laughs> I've been um, lifting a lot more frequently and cut out like all carbs from my diet <laughs> so i've been a little miserable but uh it's definitely paying off so i can't really complain so this video has definitely gone on longer than I typically record for, so I'm going to wrap this one up. I um, mm -hmm. hope you enjoyed the sounds, and like always, I just wanted to thank you all to, um, I'm just grateful for all of you, for you know the channel growing um and i specifically want to thank my uh, patreon members you guys are fantastic and i cannot thank you enough for your financial support um means a lot to me it really does so i just wanted to say thank you and this